My name is Jess Ian Diorio, and I'm the head of marketing at Starburst, which is a data and analytics company. Um, and I'm really excited to kick off this panel today all about empowering women for leadership roles in tech. And I am joined by several friends and great colleagues that I've spent a lot of time in my career with, actually. And I'm going to have them introduce themselves. So we will start with my former boss and longtime mentor, Tom Wentworth, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Hey, Jess, thanks for inviting me to this panel. I'm Tom Wentworth. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at Recorded Future. We're based in Davis Square, um, cybersecurity company focused on intelligence, and I'm really happy to be a part of this conversation. Are you actually in Davis Square? Are you uh, in the office? I am right now. Wild I'm times. Wild times. Imagine that. Great, cool. All right, next we have Lucy, who we actually went to college together. We started our careers together at Forrester, and she's had an amazing career running people, so I'll love for her to introduce herself now. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Jess. Excited to be here. Um, right now, I am the head of people at Numerated Growth Technologies. Uh, we help banks uh, create their digital experience for commercial lending. Uh, I am not in the office. I am at home. I do not plan to go into the office for a little bit, uh, but uh, really excited to be here and to talk about how we can all help uh, women get roles in leadership. Awesome. Thank you. And we have Susan, who we both work together across Forrester and Acquia, and, and she's pretty dominant in the Boston ecosystem. Uh, so I'm excited to have her introduce herself. Thank you, Jess. Great to be here uh, with Lucy and Tom as well. Uh, my name is Susan Ahn. I am currently the senior sales director for a company called Tessian. We've just started to build out our go-to-market organization within Boston, but based out of the UK um, in email security. So I've been in cyber for quite some time and really excited for the topics at hand today. Looking forward to the discussion. Great. All right. Well, let's get started. Um, so just to set the stage for the discussion today, we are talking about empowering women to grow into leadership positions in tech. And we're talking about it from a couple of angles, from the angle of the person who is in the position of power to bring a woman up, promote a woman, but also from the position of women who are trying to move up, having struggles, hitting barriers, etc. So Feel free to ask questions on both vectors if you happen to be in a leadership position and you're trying to identify new opportunities to help a woman grow, or if you're in that seat, or if you're a man, we're, we're happy to have many more men joining this, this conversation as well. Just feel free to ask questions from all angles. We're also gonna hit two specific topics. The first topic we're gonna talk about is really about um, up-leveling your strategic impact. I wrote an article which is basically um, summarizing one of the main barriers I've seen in my career to women growing in their uh, leadership positions, and that's a bias-based perception about strategic potential. So the article is called She's Not Strategic. You can check it out. Um, but it does walk through, uh, just based on my own career, what I've seen as one of the bigger barriers. We'll talk about that strategic impact first. And then we're going to go on to a topic of mentorship versus sponsorship, really breaking apart what are the differences there, why you need both, and most importantly, how to get both. Um, so that's how we'll flow the conversation today. Um, so I'm going to get started on the strategic contribution topic. And I want to ask Lucy a question first. Um, on, along the lines of these bias and perception issues, have you witnessed a woman's strategic contribution being unfairly judged at any point in time uh, in your career? And, and how have you tried to help or advise women in those situations? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've probably seen uh, not just women's strategic contributions, but leaders in general, too. And so I would say that this certainly applies to women, but I think to anyone, the more senior that people get in organizations, the more critical it is that you are aligned your ex the expectations of your performance, that you're aligned with your leaders on that. And I think it's our job to educate our CEO, board, whomever it might be so that you can agree upon what is what does strategic look like or what are the expectations of this role and have that really clear understanding. Um, because I think oftentimes what happens is, in particular, women will operate, uh, execute, make things happen and not necessarily pause to level set with whomever their leader is to make sure that they're meeting those expectations. And so you find yourself in a place where you're like, wow, I've done, I've done all of this, Has, hasn't anyone seen it? And it's because you're not using the same language as your boss. So um, I've definitely seen that. And I do think um, uh, aligning on expectations is critical. Yeah. 
I think that that's a huge topic of getting um, too focused on operational or kind of unfortunately getting pinned as operational versus strategic. Um, so I think it's really important if you feel like that's happening to yourself, you, you identify it and then you talk with your manager about, about how to move forward. Um, and then Susan, um, another side of this challenge is that I, I often notice women struggling to sell themselves. You know, you know, the end result is they may, maybe undersell themselves, but they're afraid of being overconfident and being dinged for that as well. So it's a bit of a tightrope walk. Um, do you have anything that you can share, examples of seeing women who have been able to share their achievements successfully and sell themselves? Yeah, I think one of the um, examples that I'd probably use is um, I worked at a company called Carbon Black for nine and a half years. They were recently in the last year acquired by a company called VMware. And I hired over 150 people in the sales development program there during my tenure. And one of the things that I really found was that, you know, um, when we we would debrief on candidates, one of the things that we heard a ton about, you know, regarding the male candidates was their potential, right? But we would judge women by what they've already accomplished or what, mm. what was on their resume. So I think first, um, the thing that I would say is that the biases that, that we all have to acknowledge the internal biases that we have regarding standards, right? So the fact that we judge men by their potential, but women by what they've accomplished, I think is something that we have to coach on all levels. The other thing that I would say is that women um, regarding self-promotion, like men are okay with taking off like one or two boxes on a list of requirements that, you know, that are out there for certain jobs. Women always feel like they have to check up every single box. And I think that's where we, you know, talk about like having to lean in a little bit and say like, hey, I, I can do this. Um, my track record shows that I can accomplish these things and to kind of lean in towards that way. I think Harvard Business Review had, you know, wrote, written an article about how women also use different words to describe their work, whereas, you know, men would use words like unprecedented, you know, groundbreaking, and women would downplay some of the, um, some of the research that they would do, particularly in the life sciences. I think that applies like across the board in any vertical, and it's something that we should be more cognizant of and make a proactive effort to change. Yeah, I'm only laughing because Tom and I have been working on, you know, in our time where he was the CMO and I was the head of product marketing, we spent a lot of time working on messaging and positioning and that word unprecedented <laughs> took me back, took me back. But over to you, Tom, you know, I just want to thank you for joining us because it takes a brave man to show up on a panel about women's leadership. I think there can be a lot of, you know, fear about if I speak out on this topic, am I going to be heard in the wrong light? So I really appreciate you joining us. Um, and I really appreciate your mentorship over the years. Uh, the question I have for you is sort of back to this operational or too tactical versus strategic view. How do you, you know, as someone who runs marketing teams and you do in fact manage a lot of women, how do you assess strategic potential? Um, I'll start there. You yeah. Know. I think the challenge for women is they're so, in my experience, my managers have been so good at execution and so focused on delivering results. And it makes it difficult to take a step back. You know, if you're, if you're focused on daily and literally daily execution of results and, and any sort of anything that's going to impact that is a huge challenge. So I think I've had to be able to make sure that my teams can take a step back. It's okay. If, if you don't, if you miss some sort of goal, if you're trying to find ways to do things better, smarter, faster, cheaper, to have an impact on the business, I think we've just got to get out of the mentality of measuring women's success based on getting stuff done. It's interesting, but I think too many women focus just there, which mm -hmm. then the men who come in with the big adjectives, right, um, change the conversation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I even recognize in my own, own career, there have been times where if I'm about to miss a number, I'm scared to death and I'm, I'm completely over rotated on that. And, uh, you know, it's taking away from time for me to step back and reassess and figure out how to, how to get better. Um, and so I, I think I see that in a lot of other women as well, like scared to death of poor performance and results, because maybe it makes you think that you're going to lose your status as the only woman in the room or whatever mm -hmm. that role is. So, um, but I think it is, it is super important to exercise building a skill of being able to step back, reflect and own, hey, this didn't work out well, and here's where we're moving forward. Hey, uh, Jess, just on that note, I think um, one of the uh, things that I've seen women, when they've made this transition from sort of uh, very tactical, operational to strategic, they've been able to um, um, say no <laughs> and say no confidently and say no and why. Right. And so I've also I can recognize my own career, but I've seen many other women, to your point, like, over rotate, just try to do it all. 
Um, and it's either get burnt out or told, you know, but the practice of saying no and articulating the trade-offs to your senior leaders is incredibly valuable. So. And, and the most important skill that we don't teach anyone, there's no handbook on how to say no, but the people who can say no effectively and women saying no and saying that's this, that's the action of being strategic is saying no. Yes. I think there should be an entire book on that. Lucy, if you could write it, I would. Yes, please. Yes, great. Yeah. Still working on that. Um, I, I did think at one point in my career, I was volunteering way too much for too many things. And it was actually taking away from my ability to execute well on core job. And so I, I came up with this in my head. I'm going to volunteer when it's strategic, when it gets me visibility, um, when it when it gets me access to a new new executive or new audience. But yeah, I think that that's along the lines of, of what you're saying. Don't do everything. Don't take on too much. Um, take on really important things um, and focus. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I'll ask all of you. You can volunteer if you're if you're ready to talk on it. But what advice do you have for women to better showcase their potential um, to be strategic? Anybody want to start? I'm a big fan of um, taking the time, and this doesn't work in all cultures. But if your organization is willing to like have that PowerPoint about your function or your expertise or whatever, and just have your pitch deck in your back pocket. So that in situations, and my, this might be also just a little bit of because I've often come into the organizations and tried to build a people team. So you have to do some education around what that is. But just have your pitch deck at the ready so that when there's an opportunity to articulate why you should be involved in something or why you're going to say no or whatever, you have that context. Um, and I found that very helpful. Like if I have it set up already, I like it's a it's a pitch that I can go through easily. So create that for yourself. I think to Lucy's point, I think it's also really important to ask for the form in which to do that. So if you're being given projects or you volunteer for certain things or you're building out a program, don't settle for sitting in the background and doing all the work and not getting any recognition for it. Ask your boss, ask your mentors, your sponsors within the company to give you a platform to explain why that work has impact and explain how that 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 project is helping the company accelerate its growth. Right. Like, I think that's really important to showcase the work and highlight um, sort of all of the benefits that the company and the team is getting from the work that you're actually doing. Yeah. Any thoughts to share, Tom? I think there's two things. One, the simplest way for me is always, if somebody comes to me and says, what can I take off your plate? And, and coming and just taking something and owning it and driving it, and then coming back and communicating the impact it delivered. And, and I think delivering it in terms of business impact and not in terms of I did six webinars and I sent 4,000 emails. Somebody who can do those, that thing for me is just, it's an incredible contribution to the business mm -hmm. and to me personally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think of specific examples where if you're in marketing, you don't talk about leads or MQLs, you talk about contribution to pipeline, contribution to bookings. Or if you're in finance, you can talk about cost savings, customer success, talk about this that it contributed to improved customer satisfaction. You know bring it up to revenue, customer satisfaction, growth, those types of things, um, and be thinking about that yeah. um, and using it in your communication. And just even just having the conversation with your leader about where you're, just having that level of conversation shows that you're strategic. Like, hey, this is what I'm working on. And so what are, if you don't know, what, what business um, results you're impacting, you know, if you're in a different level of the organization, it's not that clear, ask that question. And that's already gonna put you in a different light for your leader. Yeah, 100%, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, sometimes different companies are not great at sharing the strategy or the overall goals with the entire company. So take it upon yourself to push your manager to learn those if they're not clear to you and then, it, and then you can attach to them. Yeah, and I've, I've worked with female leaders that basically had, you know, that understood what the top line strategic goals of the company is and would align all of the um, projects and all of the action items that, that they would take in their organization around those strategic initiatives and make sure that when they're presenting on like the accomplishments of the team, that they would highlight how it, you know, aligned with uh, the larger strategic goals of the company. I think that that's a really important um, point, Jess. And a lot of times, I think because women are such executors and, and are extremely operational, like we focus on the job at hand, but really tying those things to the strategic initiatives that align with the company's ultimate goals are like really um, a way to showcase and talk up sort of the work that you're actually putting in. Yeah. 
So we're going to move into a session which is just really about some very pointed examples. So for anybody listening that is looking for some specific ideas. Um, so I want to start with Lucy, and because your purview is the head of HR, so you see all movement from careers, you see who stands out, who's being talked up. Um, what are the types of contributions that have hit your radar that come to mind um, that are helping you view someone for a promotional path? Yeah, uh, it's very much what we just talked about. So it's the ability to take the work that they've done and tie it to business results and moving it forward. I will also say moving the business forward. I will also say that as an HR professional, it's important to me to create um, some standard language so that we can reduce bias across across these. You know, so like if we know like we know what good leadership looks like and we've articulated that and we've published that, then it's easier for all of us as leaders to identify who actually hits those marks. And it's not as much of a like, oh, so-and-so is better at selling themselves than not. Um, so I would just, I, that goes back to like uh, the specific advice I would give, which is if your organization does not have clarity around what good leadership looks like, have that conversation so that you can hit that, hit, you know, hit all, check all those boxes and feel confident doing that. Um, but it, it really is about, uh, and I'm sorry to review what I said in the beginning, but the idea of like, what are expectations? Let's get clear on them so that no one's guessing and that you can really just feel like confident in fulfilling what your organization needs. Awesome. That makes perfect sense. Um, I've got a specific question for, for you, Susan. Can you think of a time in your career, you know, maybe when you were more up and coming, uh, where your work was recognized by the executive team? Um, any examples to share? Yeah, I mean, I built the sales development program at Carbon Black from the ground up. I hired, I think, 27 net new reps that first year I was in the program, built all the building blocks, worked cross-functionally to provide um, you know, feedback to product marketing about messaging, um, to work with marketing on like, you know, what are the campaigns and things that work really well. I think I was really lucky um, that I had a mentor who was always also, um, who also had enough influence to be a sponsor, right? And I know we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But, um, but even in the midst of all of that, the one thing that I wanted to highlight about that particular time in my career is that I had to ask for the next step up. Because what happened was, I was really good at that one thing and I was great at building out the sales development work. And most people would have wanted me to stay in that role for a long period of time. But everybody knows that in sales, quota carrying revenue generating teams are what gets like those leaders are paid more. They're, uh, you know, they, they're elevated in their careers a lot further. And I wanted that step, but I really had to push and ask for that. So uh, the advice that I would have for anybody, particularly women, um, is don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't you know stay in the role that's comfortable for everybody to, for you to be in, right? Like ask for the opportunity to move up and um, and ask for that seat at the table, particularly if you've already done a really good job at getting recognition for something that's been really impactful across the company. So great time, but also like had to be proactive about asking for that next step. And Susan, I'd add to that that um, it's important to be able to articulate what the next step is and the opportunity and why that will impact the business and why it's a good thing, not just the, hey, I've done this, so I deserve this, right? And sometimes, so the, the sort of sweet spot of like, as, a, as an HR professional, I love it when um, skill and aspiration meet with business need. And mm -hmm. if, so if you get good at identifying where there's a gap in a business need and you feel like your skills and abilities can, can fill that for the organization, being able to talk about it in that way can also help um, try to, you know, sell sell that. And so, Susan, I'm sure you saw a business opportunity and you said, I can do this for you, you know, and uh, and that's a good way to go. Yeah, I agree with you, Lucy. And I think the thing that I thought about the time was that there it's so, you know, I think from like a leadership perspective, people are always like, well, it's really easy to find people to do that job, right? I could go find men to do that job. But this job, you're already doing it. You're really good at it. Like, we'd love for you to do this job, right? So like, mm -hmm. I think that's the kind of barrier that you're trying to like break the cross and um, asking for a seat at the table that you deserve and that you've worked really hard for and that you can get to a point where you can do that job that they could get a man for easily is I think really important just because they can't get a man to do the job that I was already doing doesn't mean that I should stay in that role. I think that's the thing that, um, that you know, I want people to advocate for. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I'm going to ask a quick question of Tom, which is unscripted, so get, get ready, Tom. But um, well, I'm excited that we have our first question, so we'll come to this in one minute. My question for you, Tom, is back to your career, you transitioned from being in pre-sales, which is not not strategic, but then you navigated into overall marketing leadership from there. Like, how did you do that? Yeah, I mean, I think I, this is advice that works across the board. The closer you are to the customer in any business, I think the more successful you can be. And I have spent my career being really close to the problem that my companies were solving because I was out on the front lines. Um, so I think that was when it was time for me to join marketing, being close to the customer was a competitive advantage for me over the other marketers who were sort of too internally focused. So I think in general, in any role at any company, the closest, the closer to customer you can get, the more successful you're going to be. And all of us on this call are obviously very close to customers. Yeah. Awesome. That's great advice too. I think, you know, I've even thought about transitioning my career away from marketing into customer success because it's so strategic. So, um, so this I love because I think about this a lot. And I remember a long time ago at Acquia, I was in, a, uh, Tom Erickson was the CEO and I was in a conference room. He came in from a women's networking event and he said to me, you know, you know what the problem is with this woman in tech conversation is there's no men in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And like, I, first of all, I was like eight months pregnant and I was a little taken aback at a minute because like, oh yeah, here we go. It's, a, it's the white horse thing, but he was 100% correct. Um, there need to be more men in the conversation. There's no progress without the bulk of the leaders caring about this, making it a priority and promoting um, women. Um, so I, I think we for she is an awesome movement. That's why I'm excited Tom's here. I didn't want to do this panel without a man. I don't even really want to join women's only networking forums because I don't think they're as helpful as if we can get a diverse group talking about this. Um, so I am pro, you know, when I do work on my own, whether I'm writing an article or um, something like that, my, my current CEO, Justin Borgman, has worked on that with me. We partnered in this content creation, and I think that is critical. He shares it. He believes in it. And so having partnership that is, you know, not just women trying to solve this for women is, is critical. But that's how I feel. Anybody else have any comments on this? I will say that... Um, being part of the conversation, absolutely. Uh, being on panels, Tom, yes, absolutely. And it's the day-to-day -day activity. So I'll give you one example of a, my last CEO who I worked with, and this, it was a moment for me in my career. Obviously, I participate in executive searches for as we're building out executive teams, right? This was the first person who, when we were talking about a candidate, he used she as a pronoun, meaning a, a hypothetical candidate. So instead of saying, he might have worked at blah -de blah they might, or even they, which gender neutrality is a good thing too, so l let me not. But the fact that he said, you know, she might be a person who's come from this type of company was amazing and I actually saw the recruiters go, oh, right? And so even little stuff like that can be such a difference, can make such a difference. And so I encourage, uh, I encourage that kind of stuff day to day too. I mean, for me, this, this slide represents kind of how I try to run my team. We've had a few opportunities this year for people on my team to take new roles and responsibilities. And I've, in some ways it's been hard because I think women have the imposter syndrome at an even higher level than men do. And I have people on my team who, who struggle with imposter syndrome, even though they do an amazing job. I've had to sort of, in some cases, really pull a couple of people forward, um, some women on my team, because I knew they could do the job and now they're many quarters into doing it incredibly successfully. Um, I think it, it, men do have to step up. I think we do need to help because we've I, I've certainly seen what success looks like with people like Jess. I want to develop more Jesses, I guess. Works pretty well in my career. You're pretty good at it. So yeah, keep doing that. That's awesome. I, I, I like one of my examples with Tom was at Aquio. We were getting so big that the leadership team was really getting too big, the executive team in particular. And I had been there and I was loving it because I was growing so much and learning so much. You know, I was leading a team, but I also just had a seat at the table. And as this concept of we're too big, maybe we need to refine the size of the executive team came out, Tom fought for me to stay there. And I just, I really appreciate that. I think that's an awesome example of sponsorship, mentorship, et cetera. Um, and we for she. 
Um, any other comments, Susan, anything to share? No, I agree with everything that Lucy and Thomas said. And I think the other, th the one thing that I would like watch out for, and I hear this a lot, particularly on sales teams, right? Because sales teams are, tend to be very male dominated. And um, one of the things that people talk about when they interview um, up and coming candidates on you know the sales side is they'll say about um, like some women, like, I don't know if she's quite right. You know, she's quite the right fit from a culture perspective. Um, the thing that I put out there for people to think about is what does that really mean? Like, how do we define culture? Because sometimes that just means that, you know, she's different or they don't speak the same language or they don't say it in the same way that like a man would. Right. But that doesn't mean that a woman's perspective or a different personality type or a different method of going away about like, you know, communicating is 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 bad for the business. It's just different from the way that things used to be. And we are trying to change like the the legacy way of how we run businesses, the teams that have come to come together. Right. So I think being open to diversifying, not just from like a gender perspective or from a URM candidacy perspective, but also like in terms of thought, communication, personality types and really diversifying in that way is an important component to how men can step up and help, um, you know, shine a light to like bringing differences into the company that we didn't have before. Awesome. Um, this, this question I piggybacks on what Tom mentioned about basically telling someone, no, you can do the job, you're gonna do the job, you know, and forcing them into it. I think it's a good topic though, um, in my, in my team right now, uh, there's tons of high potential people. Um, one woman in particular, particular, I knew I wanted to promote. I knew I needed to get her visibility opportunities with the CEO, and so I coached her on her presentation for the particular event strategy, and then I made myself absent, and she went in and presented it on her own. And I think that's that's a that's a good example of pre-coaching, but then as a leader, getting out of the way and letting that team member shine, and and that's their forum, that's their they have the floor, um, and it's their opportunity to show off their their thought process and their strategy. Um, so that's something that, that I think is a good idea. Uh, anybody else have any other tips, tricks for coaching? Yeah, for me, Jess, it's if you own impactful business metrics, it's so easy to show impact. And I love it at Recorded Future. You know, my, the, my whole demand gen team is led by women and we are absolutely crushing our numbers and they get to stand up and be the face of the fact that marketing generates 53% of our new business pipeline and they own it. It's a huge win for them all the way up to the CEO. So I think it comes back to giving somebody something they can own that is clearly impactful to the business and making it be their thing. It is not my thing, it is their thing. And, and I think that's put them in a really great spot at the company. I couldn't agree more, Tom. And I think also like just women speaking up in important strategic meetings where we talk about data and we talk about impact is really important. Oftentimes I see women who have all of the data and have all of the information and know like what's been done, but they won't speak up in meetings and they just kind of sit in the background. And I, and I like, I'd love to see more women. And a lot of times I coach some of the more rising stars in our, in our, um, in our organization that are women to come forth and just like kind of participate in that conversation and lead the conversation. Yeah. We've got another fascinating one. We're pretty far off our script, but we have tons of questions, so I'm excited about it. I think this topic is fascinating, too. Um, I think I, I touched on it a little bit in the mentorship versus sponsorship, but but there is, you know, and um, this is a funny story, but I did read somewhere that going back to the days of the cavemen and women, uh, that was sort of the beginning of jealousy because, you know, fighting for having the best male in that scenario at that point in time meant life or death or the fact that you would have the better children or the better gene pool. And so so there's this whole archaeological perspective of women and jealousy. And I think about it a lot and I see it play itself out a variety of ways. But definitely in the workplace, you, you can see that there are scenarios where some women may seem less um, less supportive than you might expect of other women. I think it's a damn shame. I, I don't see it happen myself too much um, these days, but I think that I think that it does happen. Um, any comments from the panelists on on this topic and and how maybe uh, we can change that? I mean, I, I've certainly seen seen this happen, and it's unfortunate. But I I think my approach to it um, is like you can only control what you can control, right? So like from my perspective, I'm a female leader, and I have the opportunity to sort of change the trajectory of 
um, the DNI numbers across my company as I recruit for you know the sales development organization, and I try to do that. The other thing that I would say is like it's really important not just to talk about diversity and inclusion, but really be inclusive. Invite not just the ideas of women, but ideas of all people on your team to come forward and share and um, and really kind of highlight their strengths and help build on that. And then that coaches them to also be those kinds of leaders in the future. So that's kind of the thing. I would say the focus is really like, how do we individually become better leaders? How do we lead better conversations, lead better trajectory for the future by hiring the right people and, and coaching them in the right way? So that's the thing that I, I, I sort of try to focus on. Cool. All right, we're going to move on to the topic of sponsorship and mentorship. So we have a, a good question here, which is about how do you find a mentor? Let's before we take that one, let, let's go into the sponsorship topic. So um, first, I think it's important to level set on the differences between mentorship and sponsorship because they are different. And Susan, would you mind taking a pass at that? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, the biggest thing is, and it's everybody on the call probably knows this, but the difference between um, a sponsor and a mentor is usually uh, power and influence, right? So mentor is really, I look at them as being a coach, um, someone who can kind of guide you, provide you with feedback. Um, sponsors don't always have the ability to coach you, but they have the ability to give you a platform in which for you to shine or influence or have a seat at the table. And so I think those are the two biggest differences that I see between those roles. Anything to add, Lucy and Tom, from your experience? Just that I think uh, sometimes it's easy to get caught with a lot of mentors and no sponsors, <laughs> which I know yeah. we'll be talking about how to get those sponsors. But I just, sure. you know, it's great. It's great to have coaches and mentors and you got to you got to ask for the sponsor. Yeah. And it, that was the second article I wrote is about this. And I think of mentors as those who help you open doors for yourself, coaching and advice. Mm -hmm. How can I get better? And then sponsors can open those doors for you. They're in power. Um, and they can create opportunities for you. And I, and I, I think too often, you know, and I, I think this actually goes back to that question about um, maybe in, at times men being more open to sponsoring than women. Um, one of my pieces of advice in that article is you have to find people who are exhibiting patterns of sponsorship for others. So whether it's men or women doesn't really matter. You have to find people who are clearly sponsoring others, who are clearly willing to help support development and growth that are in positions of power. Um, so on this topic, um, if we both agree, you know, we all agree mentors and sponsors are critical. The big topic is how do women find sponsorship? Um, Tom, do you have any, have any ideas about how to start? I mean, selfishly for me, sponsorship, my biggest challenge is a leader's hiring. So I always look at chances to sponsor people as a way to build a relationship with the people that I eventually am going to hire or probably more likely work for. So it's a little bit self serve it's a win for me. I hope it's a win for the people that I try to give this opportunity to. But from my perspective, it just lets me do my job more effectively. It's not something that's hard for me to think of doing. Like I get to build, and it gets to get to build a reputation. There's so much good in it for the people that take the time to do it. There's no reason not to. And, and it's obviously hopefully good for the people that, that you're able to create opportunities for. I'm gonna play on that for a second. So that's the leadership perspective, but if you're listening and you're looking to grow, um, what you could then do based on Tom's advice is ask your, your, your leader, what are the things that you're looking to hire for? What are the pain points you have where you don't currently have someone in that seat right now? Is there a way I can help with that? Maybe I could grow into that role. So that, that's the flip side of taking the pain Tom has as, as, a, as a leader, which is hiring, um, and then taking that as an opportunity to position yourself for growth. Um, Anyone else have advice on, on how to find sponsorship? I mean, typically for me, like in the past, um, I've had, I, you know, I, I just tell them like, hey, here are my career ambition, ambitions. These are the things that I wanna do. Like, what do you see in me? What are, where are the areas that I need to grow? And usually if you ask sponsors that question because they, they, they then have like a stake in your growth and development. And when you've hit all of those marks that they're looking for, you come back to them, let them know, hey, these are some of the things that I've done. This is how it's impacted the business. Um, and, then and then I ask for the opportunity, right? To have a platform in which to share that and to advance in my career. Um, I think asking, I mean, I know I keep coming back to that, but you have to ask for those opportunities. I think the biggest different differences that I see between like men and women that I've worked with is that men always ask and women always wait. Right. Mm -hmm. 
think it's time for yeah, us to and, add. I, and I think that's where you know you have a dead end and you're looking at maybe a mentor versus a sponsor. If you ask for that visibility and they won't provide it for you, if you ask for an opportunity and you're not getting it, you have to find someone else. I think it's like you have to have multiple eggs in the basket here with this whole sponsorship topic. You can't just yeah. pull your eggs in one basket because they may not turn out to be helpful. Um, I would also say that often the people with the most power, it's great when people in power have a, uh, see themselves as sponsored and, and care about this and want to do this, you know, like, t like Tom has done in his career. There's also a lot of people who are just have a lot on their mind <laughs> and are responsible for a lot of things and it's not on their radar. And so that's why asking to Susan's point is so important because sometimes someone might think that you're an incredible talent, but it's just not even on the radar that you could be the person that's, that's going to the board instead of them. Um, and so asking also just, you know, people in power are busy. So it's good to say, Hey, I'm here for you. How can I help you? And also how can you help me? Yeah. Do you, does anybody have any stories they want to share about bad experiences with mentors or sponsors that, that can help people identify if they're in an unhealthy mentorship or sponsorship relationship? I'll just say, be careful. Like there are a lot of mentors who probably shouldn't be providing mentoring. <laughs> There's a lot of advice that's frankly not great. Like you need to just don't, don't rush into a mentor or sponsor relationship before you fully understand what you're getting into. Because I've seen it have negative impact on people's careers being attached to the wrong mentor. And sometimes it's hard to recover from that. Yeah, Tom, I, I so agree with Tom. And one of the things that I would look out for is like, check to see if all you're ever really getting is positive reinforcement, right? If like, it's great to hear when people tell you how awesome you are and how great you're doing. But one of the greatest things about really impactful mentors and sponsors is that they're going to give you feedback on things that you really need to work on. That's going to elevate your skill set, right, and take you to the next level. So I really look for that in 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 mentors and sponsors. Like, am I just are just telling me things because they want to be close with me and they want to tell me like really good things about what I'm doing, or are they do they really care about my advancement, my development? There's this thing called um, uh, high standards, deep devotion that Francis Frey talks about from Harvard Business School. And I really adhere to that. It's kind of like um, radical candor as well, if many of you guys have read it. It's really about like, you know, I, I you have high standards for people because you're deeply devoted to their success. And you look that, for that in people that are gonna be mentoring you and sponsoring you, because that means that they really care. So that's the one thing that I'd put out there. I love that, Susan, yes. I'm trying to find a link to the book to put it in the chat while we're talking, because it's like, I think all these great resources are coming out, so I've, I've lost time for that. But if anybody has time to look up that article from Frances Fry, she has a book out. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's Unapologetic Guide to Leading or something like that, but it's, it is really good. Um, She's awesome. Yeah. I just wanted to add a few comments on my own. You know, like for, for me, some of the negative experiences have been when I'm talking with someone who's got me in a, in a feedback cycle and I feel like I'm constantly editing myself. And oftentimes, you know, this might be, well, that was defensive or you're making excuses. And sometimes that's real and useful, but sometimes it's purely negative and you get paralyzed with the feedback. So look for pe you know, look out for people who are nonstop tweaking who you are as a person. And that's not helpful. That's, that's taking away your authenticity. Watch out for people who uh, are advising you on politics. It's really not useful. I mean, and then watch out for credit mongers um, because that's that's obviously very negative when you're thinking you're working with someone and they're going to help you, but they're actually separately taking credit for it. Um, Tom, one for you. Any advice about encouraging other men in positions of power to take an active approach to empowering women? Oh, you're muted. You need the shirt. You're on mute. Sorry. I saw all of you other muting, so I thought it was like the on vogue thing to do. <laughs> Mark, my suggestion is it's just better for business. So I, I think it's, uh, if you want to, I don't know what role you're in, but if you want to, to succeed faster and be more successful wherever you are, I think this is just something you have to do. And it has to be a part of how you look at developing your organization. Otherwise, you're gonna go back to just promoting men who are really good at using adjectives. Like what was the one we were talking about earlier? I already forgot. Uh, unprecedented. unprecedented. <laughs> You're going to hire a bunch of unprecedented men in roles that they may or may not be the right fit for. So from my perspective, being proactive and being intentional about 
empowering people at all levels of your organization is the only way that you're going to build a high performing, you know, team in whatever function you're in. So just have to be intentional about it. You just can't let it happen because it won't. I've had two incidents re recently where um, I didn't realize women on my team had a specific aspiration. So it came out in the course of the conversation, but I think a t you know a, a very simple thing to do is ask people what their career goals are because I think we find women don't don't advocate for themselves as much or or clarify what their goals are. And so it might be a, you know an assumption that people make that they're happy in this operational role or they're happy where they are and they don't want more. It just might not be the case. They're just not vocalizing it. So I think identifying. And then if you identify someone who does want to grow, then you can go from there. Um, so we are just a few minutes from the breakouts. So I am going to, I think we covered the majority of what we plan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rapid fire, publish all of these questions so that everybody's questions get answered. Um, so this one, how would you recommend a woman approach their leader about moving up, timing, messaging, and next steps if nothing happens after the conversation? Um, anybody wanna start there? Uh, I just actually recently had this conversation because I'm coming into my organization at Tessian. This is like my seventh or eighth week, I think it is. And um, I wanted to ask about like, hey, as the company is growing, like where do you, you know, I asked my boss, wh what is sort of your vision for how I fit into the organizational structure? And that's the first question I asked just to get his perspective and like what his thought process is. And then I sort of shared my, you know, like my direction and my um, ambitions and the th and the drive and the motivations and the things that I'd like to get to and the things that I want to accomplish. I think that's a really good way to like start a conversation. Um, if that's the question. Yeah. Anybody else have any comments before we move on to the next one? Uh oh, I marked it as answered. My bad. The question was, what advice do you have for C-levels on how to approach conversations differently for the board level conversation versus the CEO conversation? Let's see if uh, Mia, if you can help me resurface that question. Hey, nice job, Mia. Uh, yeah, so um, I think this is an interesting one. This is this is very pointed at someone who's already in a, better, uh, a leadership position, but you still have work to do. You still have to keep your job. So how do you think differently about navigating those expectations? Um, I just came from a board meeting yesterday. <laughs> so uh, these are always stressful. I'm, I'm about six board meetings in at Star, Starburst, and you never know what the board is going to ask. Um, it depends on your domain, but I think what, what you need to be ready with is a little bit of what Lucy mentioned earlier. What's your pitch deck? What's your high-level talking point on what's working and what's not in your function at the board level? They're not going to get into, you know, in my universe, how many how many new visitors are hitting the website. They don't really want to hear those levels of detail. They want to hear your reflection as a leader of what's working and what's not. Whereas your, your CEO is probably going to want to go deeper on ROI. You know, they're going to want to go deeper on metrics, but not too deep. So I, I think about it as cascading levels of the board is the absolute highest level of conversation I'm going to have about my function. The CEO is next to that, so I can't be mired in too many details. But I need enough details and proof points that he knows things are going well or the things that aren't going well, I have a plan for it. And I would I read this question as a little bit uh, maybe more negative, so it might not be this or potentially negative, but like that does my board do my board and my CEO agree on what yeah. expectations are? And so just to add a little different flavor <clears throat> there. This is very obviously dependent on the individuals and the culture and, and all that, but in my experience. Being clear and articulating where you see a difference and it is an okay thing to do and actually is shows your sort of power and confidence and um, strategic ability to identify when things are not aligning and, and facilitate a conversation to try to get clarity there. Uh, but that's obviously there's a, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but that's just what, what I was thinking when I read that question. Just have the conversation. I could go all day on this one, but my take is it's the CEO's job to manage the board. It's your job to manage the CEO. You spend your time educating the CEO. Let them be the ones who educate the board on marketing. Like don't over, I used to over rotate and like freak out about board meetings until I now have a better perspective on the CEO board relationship. Make the CEO happy and the board meeting is going to go fine. Great. Well, I really want to thank the panelists. I love this discussion. Thank you so much for lending your time and your experience to the topic. A couple questions went unanswered, but I know we need to get into our breakout groups. Um, 
So just as a reminder for those who are still with us, we're gonna have four breakout, I think there are six total breakout rooms. You can find me in a room uh, talking about how to sell yourself, You know, how do you showcase your current contributions and your future potential. Tom will be focused on how to up-level your strategic game. So if you're thinking about that, this she's not strategic topic, go meet Tom in his room. Um, Lucy is going to be talking about how to get sponsorship. So if you wanna go in deeper on sponsorship, follow Lucy. Um, and then Susan is going to talk about navigating manager to leader promotion. So if you're in the management seat today and you're really trying to get to that, that next leadership click, that's what Susan will talk about in her breakout.